binary jazz i'm chris uh one of three hosts for the show uh i am joined by the amateur mixed martial arts performer allison tar um who's allison plus on the internet you, you thought i was going to gary with that one but that would be sexist uh and i am also uh joined by the Easter Bunny aficionado uh, binary Gary uh, on my side, uh, who's right there. Yeah. Well, good morning. Hey. Good morning. Extra good morning. Yeah. Here we are. Um, I feel like in the silence, it falls on me to explain the premise of the show, which is um, we show up with no plans in mind. Allison brings us a topic. We talk for about 40 minutes, and then we panic and answer questions for the last three minutes, and then Zoom cuts us off mid-sentence. That's, that's uh, pretty much what it is, yeah. That's yeah. the formula. It's very accurate. <laughs> OK, so the topic this week, drum roll, please. <laughs> I like the shaking also. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the topic this week is the Diderot effect. Oh, good God. <laughs> and let me give you some background. And oh, I'm, good. And I'm likely butchering the name. I'm going to anglicize it instead of Denis mm. Diderot, Denis Diderot, <laughs> who's a French philosopher. So that'll give you a little bit of a... Now you have the edge. Um, <laughs> it's strange to me that they would name like a multi-day dog sled race after him. <laughs> I'm not sure what the correlation is. Hopefully we'll shed some light on that. A multi-day versus just the single. I mean, I think if you had fast enough dogs, it could be done in a day, right? So it's more skill, like we're just not, we're not training. Like rocket-powered hounds. Yeah. <laughs> Do they use a specific type of dog? Uh, Huskies. Huskies are always used for dog sleds, I, dog sled race. But is is it is it is husky a specific enough breed, or is there like are there yeah. subgenres of? Of course, well, that's I where mean, I, I might, wanted to know. I don't. Know. There's probably yeah, it's a husky. There's, there's, that's there's, a, that's probably, clear enough, there's right? probably, but huskies are a specific breed. Alaska. But there's not like a Canadian husky and an Alaskan husky, right? There's like no difference between huskies. I. I want to say there is an Alaskan Husky, but I don't think there's like a Canadian Husky or like a West Carolina Husky. <laughs> unless you unless you bred your Husky in West Carolina or something. You've done a do-it-yourself type of deal. <laughs> West, West Carolina. Carolina West Carolina is obviously a place I just invented. <laughs> it's not only a new type of dog, but it's also a new state. A new state, yes. I remember <laughs> it's right I across kid. from East Carolina. I was watching. It's probably win, lose, or draw, or some silly, terrible TV like TV game show, and they had these speed rounds, and they asked like, "What U.S. state is the only state to have east or west in the name?" And someone answered West Carolina, and I like raged at my television at the age of eleven. I don't know why that still sticks with me. When you say West Carolina, I remember thinking like, "It's Virginia, you moron!" You know? <laughs> like, I, yeah, but what's confusing about Virginia is there's no East Virginia. There is not an East Virginia. That's where they get you. Yeah. That's where they get you. See what so the Carolina so if there was a West Carolina and an East Carolina, it'd be like Carolina is like right in the middle and it's a single city. And then you have like a state that's north that's kind of like a like a you know triangle and then a Carolina that's south that's a triangle and, and so that's all there, like there. surrounding the city of Carolina. Let me stop you there. There already is a Carolina that's south. Well, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I realize that. I'm just saying, if there is okay. also a west and east, they would have to yeah. fit it in with the north and the south, and so that Carolina would be in the middle. If you kind them, of like the Mormon Church. If you join them, it would be the United States of Carolina. 
<laughs> Our geography teachers would be so proud. <laughs> uh, they'd be something. <laughs> they'd be something. It, so I, I bring up the church uh, just because in uh, Utah cities, uh, well, in Salt Lake City and then in other places. Um, so we have the temple, uh, LDS temple. And the cities are named based on their proximity to the temple. So 100 south is one block south of the temple. 100 north is one block north of the temple. 100 uh, east and west is, you know, and, and, and it's not quite because there's not actually a 100 north and there's some, there's some variation, but that's, that's how the, the, the streets are numbered. And it's a grid system with the temple right in the middle. Um, and then in other cities, and it keeps going, it goes for quite a ways uh, until you get to the next, um, until you get far enough out of Salt Lake City that it doesn't matter anymore. Um, and then you start getting into, well, this city has a temple or this city has a big thing. And so then they start doing it based on those temples in those cities, stakes. Um, so it's kind of like a Detroit situation happening here. What's it's in like the middle of mile. Detroit? I don't know what the middle of Detroit is, but they have like the mile roads, like the further, like I want, you know. I mean, the thing in the middle is kind of important. <laughs> um, well, they only go north, so there's no middle. They just go, go north. Oh, man, they're really... Throwing, yeah, they're... they're throwing, yeah. throwing me for a loop. My grid system. <laughs> you know, we used to phrase, like, as American as apple pie. If that were the case, wouldn't cities be built, like, grids around, like, bakeries? <laughs> wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be amazing. Like, center of town, you'd have, like, city hall and a bakery. I could get behind that. So the Diderot effect, uh, I wanted to bring this around just for the sake of uh, intellectual honesty, <laughs> mentioning a, a television program that I have recently discovered uh, called The Good Place. Oh, man. I only know of it because one of the characters is a huge Blake Bortles fan. Well, which is yeah. the quarterback for the. Yes. Ironically, yes, yeah. The yeah there, there's yeah. a character. There's a character that's a super huge ja uh, Jacksonville Jaguars fan. Like, and it started as a joke, and then they were good this season, and it was a problem for the writers of the show because they didn't expect the Jaguars to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Living in Jacksonville, we really appreciated that storyline. I mean, like, like I say, I really appreciated. Like, not ironically, like, like we didn't expect them to be good either. So we went right <laughs> along with them and laughed. Like, this is awesome. Um, and and the the point. So if you have not watched the show. Uh, so we discovered it because we're really big fans of uh, Kristen Bell uh, since Veronica Mars, and and she hasn't really done anything worthwhile since then because everything that she's in kind of has sucked since then, except for Veronica Mars. Um, we watched a couple of movies, and it was they're really bad. Um, anyway, so she's in this this new show called The Good Place uh, that also has Ted Danza, which is really weird because uh, he's old and he's got white hair, uh, but this hair is still really big. Um, and uh, it, the idea is that they're all dead. Uh, and they're in the afterlife, uh, and ten, Ted Danza plays an immortal being, and the the, the season one, uh, well, they're they believe to be themselves to be in the good place, um, and one of the characters is a, is a moral philosophy professor. That's how it ties into the Diderot effect, because basically all of my uh, like a lot of the, the philosophy. Uh, texts that he talks about and, and authors that he talks about, I've actually read like Kierkegaard and, and Kant and things when I was studying philosophy um, and back in college as a as sort of a side uh, interest. Um, and so, but now like, and he talks about those things. And so now a lot of like the philosophical like concepts and stuff, uh, moral philosophy ideas, uh, I'm now learning through uh, this rather ironic television show. So the Diderot, Diderot uh, is not, uh, unfortunately, something that is talked about. So I know that it's not moral philosophy. I, I feel like... Um, also, it's a really good show. Oh, you should watch it. It is. That's real probably true. Do you watch it, Allison? Yes. Yeah. I really enjoy mm -hmm. it. I wasn't sure what to expect going in, um, but I really like the writing, and I really like seeing Ted Danson back. Makes me happy. It's really surprisingly funny, and it's like currently the funniest thing on television that we have found. Like the, we, hmm. we we watch an episode and we're like, I can't believe that was that good. Like yeah. this is a were really you, good show. Were you all Arrested Development fans when it was on originally? No, not a, not a I never watched it. 
I caught it one of the many other times around. <laughs> yeah, that was like appointment television for me when it was on. Um, it's a bit of a so. different format than that, I would say. I would say that it's not quite as self-referential. Like, gotcha. but I would still recommend that you watch it from the beginning because otherwise you'll... Yeah, there's a lot. Like, I, I was, I actually had to hold back and not giving spoilers because I wasn't, because um, the the whole the context around season one, and then you go into season two, and it's like flipped in reverse, um, kind of. Yeah. So if you, so if you talk about season two, you're gonna give away like the big reveal at the end of season one. Yeah. Um. So clearly, you were wrong in the Diderot effect. For what it's worth. It is about moral philosophy? No. No, no. It is um it's very simple, right? It is the idea that after you have conversed on something, that you feel as though you already had that knowledge. So this is a self-referential effect that Allison has for the show, right? Like this is this is uh this is two <laughs> levels deep today. I'm getting real meta. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So had the show not been named binary jazz, it would be named Diderot effect. <laughs> My middle name is actually Diderot. That's the that's the plot twist here. Allison Diderot. <laughs> we do need video um, effects, like my mind blowing right there. Like, <laughs> <sighs> or, or would it just pop? I mean, it would just be <laughs> a pop and fizzle, like. Yeah, it won't pop because you've, have you ever had those like big sinus infections where it's like so much pressure, you just wish it would explode. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Uh, I don't know that that's entirely true. That your head doesn't ever actually explode uh, when you have an infection. Because I had my eardrum actually explode uh, because I had an ear infection. So you say explode, but medically they say it's a rupture, which is not an explosion. Uh, it felt like an explosion. <laughs> what it, props to you for enduring that. That sounds cool. What did it? What did it sound like? Um. I don't like, could you actually really... hear like it breaking or did you, oh, I can't believe I asked that. Um, so is it disturbing or did it just like, like your hearing just got really bad for a while and it hurt like hell? It hurt like hell. The hearing actually got better um, because it was so like, there's so much pressure already that I was already having hearing problems. So like after it, after it broke, it was like, oh, that pressure is gone. It's still a lot of pain. But like the pain wasn't that much, like there wasn't that much difference in the pain between before and after. It was just like, oh my God, it's really horrible. And then it kind of gradually was gotcha. less horrible. Um, but uh, I don't remember hearing anything. I just remember waking up in the middle of the night and saying, oh my God, my ear. Huh. And then it like drained for three or four days. And then I went to the um, <laughs> medical clinic and got some ibuprofen or got some... Uh, I got some antibiotics. Well, that's a lovely. lovely. A little late, yeah. Lovely. And now my hearing is permanently damaged, so it's great. <laughs> yeah, I find that there are notes um, in the. Oh, I used to know what the frequency was. There are notes not not um, far off from like middle C, like slightly above middle C, that I can't actually hear that frequency. Some people speak in that range. Like I, I can see their mouth move, but I'd like miss the word sometimes. That's it's it's not bizarre. awful, but it's like that's, it's like I, it's I can like, I can turn like a little knob and hit that frequency and like hear it and then it silence and then the then the notes after it. So that's like um that's like color blindness except for hearing. Which is also the Diderot effect. So there you go. <laughs> color yeah, you you nailed it. I didn't get there, but color blindness but for hearing. <laughs> Now I wonder if there's actually, <laughs> and, and Gary, is it actually like, is it actually middle C or like somewhere around there? No, no, it's oh, it's okay. slightly above, and I don't remember what the frequency is. It's slightly above. It's not like a like a normal tuned pitch. Okay. Like it's somewhere between like C and C sharp, but okay. yeah. But it's a common enough thing that it happens. It's it it doesn't happen often because yeah. the human voice is generally like a bunch of frequencies at the same yeah. time. Um, so it's, it's not, I mean, it's not super rare, but it doesn't happen like daily. Like it happens like maybe a few times and it's happened often enough that I observe it and go, what the heck is going on? And maybe dig into it and realize that there's that. 
Have you, you ever so met someone who just talks more? <laughs> like on that frequency? <laughs> they, they hit it more often than other people? <laughs> no, I mean, not, 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 not notably. There's not anybody that I know of that I think like, I can't listen to them because I can't know what they're saying. No, it, <laughs> no, it's generally <laughs> usually is uh, female voices, but that's not always a hard and fast rule. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, I just Such imagine a, the situation where you met someone where you're like, I really like them. They're really interesting. But they <laughs> only speak at this one frequency. I just can't hear them, and it's kind of a problem. <laughs> well, uh, That's, um, um, one of the people that works at, at Human Made with me, um, uh, during so we gave flash talks at our retreat, and his flash talk was about how he has um, he literally can't remember. Like he has, he has, he's got like no short-term memory basically. Um, so he can remember like long-term things and he can like, and he can remember like that he's met you at some point, but he won't remember necessarily where or why or what your name is or what you talked about. So like he will have conversations uh, with people multiple times without realizing he's already had given, you know, told the story. So it basically makes him, um, the effect is he ends up like, you know, sort of becoming a little bit more isolating himself a little bit more because he just feels so uncomfortable about it. But it's a really just interesting, like, I don't know, uh, idea that like, I, there's just weird things in your brain. Like, like I, I have a conversation with you and then, you know, an hour later, I can't remember having that conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. hmm. Hmm. There's must... probably a word for that too. Not the Diderot effect, but very close. It's the something else. Effect. I, I feel like I would avoid telling people stories as well because I would just assume that I've already mm -hmm. told them and then that it'd be like, oh, oh. I'm, I'm being so repetitive or whatever, it's, but to the nth degree. So then it would just cut down conversation a lot too, just out of fear. Mm -hmm. that, takes that, that takes that from being like a little humorous to a little sad. Yeah, yeah well, it kind of... kind of. I do, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the context in which he gave it was it was kind of a little sad. It was, this is, here's yeah. a weird thing having to do with me, and this is something you should probably know, and here's what it is and why, how it works and whatever, and it was kind of a little sad, and it was like, you know. Huh. And then so, I, so afterwards, I was like, we haven't had a conversation. <laughs> I'm Chris. We haven't formally, like, introduced or talked. And now Thank we you have. For giving, yeah, now we have. Thank you for giving your, your talk. On the flip yeah. side, though, you get to meet you get to like have what you might think are new experiences all the time. Unless you really don't like having new experiences. That's true. Well, yeah, I said, even as I said that, I was like, that's my nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> the words are escaping your mouth and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> oh, having to do it this for the first time every time. <laughs> it's like Groundhog Day, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Um. I don't know. Have we reached a point where we ask what it is? I'm just not. <laughs> You're that. not even trying, Gary. <laughs> I just can't get there today. I, I don't know. I'm thinking about it, but. <laughs> so, Denis Diderot, um, he wrote this essay called "Regrets on Parting with My Old Dressing Gown." Um, what? If you want a lighthearted 18th century read, feel free to check it out. And who um, doesn't? But it's basically like he was pretty, um, not impoverished, but like humble, humble circumstances, I think was the phrase that kept coming up. And uh, he got this really nice new dressing gown as a gift. And then when he brought it home and got rid of his old, like full of holes, other dressing gown, he realized that like now everything in his home in contrast was just like garbage. But he only realized it because he had this like nice new shiny thing. Um, and then he started replacing all the things and went into debt. And he blamed mm. that really nice dressing gown that his friend gave him. So is the Diderot effect the going into debt because you're, or is the, like, as a result of this thing, or is the Diderot effect, like, you get something new and you realize that everything else around you is shit? <laughs> yeah, it's that one. Okay. <laughs> so it's that, it's basically like that goods are, cohesive to your sense of identity um, so that like you identify with the item somehow and think that it somehow says something about you as a person but then it also ties into the like 
it ties into your buying behavior and like a spiral of consumer behavior where then sense those like goods can change your sense of self. It like it requires you to buy new things to match that new identity because you're like, no, like I, this isn't who I am. I need something that like shows people who I am. And then you. So like if you're on, I mean, this is sort of an extreme example, but if you're on food stamps and somehow managed to purchase a Tesla, then you'd, you know, or like you're low income, but you buy a Tesla and you're like, Oh, I got a new car. And you're looking at your house. I'm like, well, that's shit. And you go inside like, Whoa, what's this? Because you have a new Tesla. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're like, no, no, I'm someone with a Tesla. Like I can't, right. Here. I'm glad I don't I have anything person, new. By the way, I hope someday everybody hears me say that in like seriousness. I own a Tesla. I can't live here. I have to live somewhere. <laughs> I have to be living in an electric orb that's on its way to Mars. <laughs> don't we all? Don't we all? Um, I'm so glad that it wasn't what I thought it was. What would you think it was? I thought that I thought it was the thing where like once you've spoken about something, you feel like you knew it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you now know. you know it. Now I do know it. Oh, that'll be next week's episode. Drag. Um, gosh, I, I have a lot of opinions on this. Um, I guess the first one is like, I wonder if there is a measurable difference in like the quality, like, like, so um, I live in squalor and I get a <laughs> 84 um, Ford, whatever Ford made 84, an 84 Ford of some sort, right? Versus a Tesla. Like either way, I have a car and I previously did not. Like is my reaction to the 84 Ford different than the Tesla? I mean, clearly yes. yes but is it, is it um, exponential or linear? I'm guessing it, it would be exponential. Logically, because, that, that because, seems to make sense, doesn't it? Because, because like, you know, I mean, we bought, 80, we bought last year the newest car that I have ever owned, and it's a 2013. It's the newest car fancy. I've ever owned. Yeah, fancy, right. Um, it's, it's got a little uh, auxiliary input. Like, I've never, owned a car, I've never owned a car that had an auxiliary input, and now I can plug my iPod in like a, somebody in the 19th century. Um, because <laughs> in the 19th century they totally had iPhones. <laughs> um, you are a tech professional. All the things you said just make me. I believe in you. <laughs> so so, but like I, that doesn't. I mean, I, I feel I did feel fancy when I first got it because it's a you know a new car to us, but it's also you know still like four or five years old. So like it's not so new that it's like like changing my sense of identity. Um, although I think buying this house kind of did a little bit <laughs> of thinking about it. Um, but I so think that's the thing is that sometimes, even though it's like an awareness of, of your options, like it can, I think it can change your, your sense of identity for the better. It doesn't always mm. have to be. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be like, and then I spiraled downward and <laughs> into a consumer pit. It could be like, I leveled up and this feels great. And like, I like, I like this new sense of, what this represents so yeah, I, I think had, i think the key is to not make it not make whatever that thing is that new thing be so disproportionate to your normal existence like it needs to, it, it, like in order to like 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 if i were to buy a tesla i'm gonna there's gonna be several steps before getting to the tesla you know what i mean like like maybe upgrade to a hybrid and then like a new hybrid, you know, like, and then eventually like, I'll be at a point where I'll be like, yeah, a Tesla actually makes, you know, both economical and environmental and like, you know, sense in terms of like who I am in where I'm at in my, in my identity in my life. So I, I, um, I bought a minivan in October, November, Ooh. one of those. Oh, I know. Right. Yeah. I don't, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I bought a minivan. <laughs> Real, um, real grown up. <laughs> yeah, I traded in. I mean, a minivan is such the grown up car. I mean, there's nothing more so, that doesn't. There's nothing that speaks more to being a grown up than owning a minivan because you're well, not a teenager and own. Let a me minivan. tell you where I'm headed with this. Right, time out, time out. So my previous vehicle was um, a Chevy Volt, right, which is okay. like electric first yep. and then yep. ICE. Um, so I would get like forty or fifty miles on a um, on a charge, and then Ooh. the yeah. Oh my gosh, it was so cool. And I then switching car. from that, I from feel a like minivan. that to minivan. Even though the minivan, 
but that was like a thir- 2013 and the minivan's a 2015 or so. I don't know. It does. They all look the same. It's a minivan from yep. a few years ago. Um, it doesn't have a hundred thousand miles on it yet. So, um, it, the, um, the long and short, it was like that to me, like, well, I paid more for the minivan, um, was definitely not a situation where I was getting a better vehicle. And, but it did reframe me as an adult, uh, which sort of sucked. <laughs> so there's that too. Yeah. Well, like, like a minivan and also like a station wagon, like these are things that like, they're like, I am now a parent or I'm now an adult. Like I, I'm responsible. Like they don't, they don't, they're not like, Hey, I'm having fun. And like, you know, it's like, no, but I, I have, am. That's I have the a problem. <laughs> I have, I have a Saturn. <laughs> it's not flashy. It's functional. Yeah. I, I, um, I wish I had a purchased a minivan with the first two kids. Like I waited until we have a third kid with like the, you know, seating is a necessity. Well, yeah, um, that makes sense. But I didn't want a minivan with the first two. Um, or when, a, when we, I traded my pickup truck to get a, like a hatchback. Or a, I don't know. It's like a station wagon, but we don't call them station wagons anymore. We, we call them. We call them. I guess we call it a wagon. Cro- yeah. Crossovers. Yeah, sort but it's a Kia, so it's not. A, it's not crossing anything. Okay. Over. Yeah. But did you avoid getting the minivan because you thought of the identity part? Yeah. Oh yes, a hundred percent. It was a big identity part getting a minivan this time. I'm like, I want a minivan. Maybe we can get like a nice SUV that's fuel efficient. Ha. Huh. Maybe we can. Um, I don't know. There's got to be a better solution than a minivan. And ultimately, logistically, like minivan makes the most sense now that I have it. Like, yeah, yeah. Suddenly, I don't care as much about the identity portion. Like, we drove in snow in this thing. It mm-hmm. was awesome. I can. I. I mean, I drew, like the whole family was in it, and we drove to Georgia, and it took six hours to get there, and we're, you know, four hours. Of, no, yeah, it was six hours. Of, I don't know. It was a long day, and. Um, and it was because I was in this like bulletproof huge vehicle with all the kids and things we needed. And I couldn't do that in any other vehicle I don't. Yeah. Not legally anyway. There's, there's a, there's a SUVs are, are good for families, but only for good for families that have four people. <laughs> if you get more than that, then an SUV isn't going to cut it anymore. And you kind of have to do the minivan because you kind of need to drive a bus. I mean, or could just get a bus. Just a legitimate decision. And then we swung around to van life and, and bus conversions once more. <laughs> yes. There are some recurring themes in this show. We can't help it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Van life. And this is where we so, got our sponsorship from Tesla. <laughs> Come on, take it away. <laughs> my my uh, a friend of mine in Tampa uh, sent me a message and said he put a deposit down on a three that day and he's super excited so i'm excited for him i've i've looked into lo- the logistics of of actually owning a tesla uh for the types of things that we like to do and the problem is that we like to go out into the middle of nowhere and camp and do things like that or go on these long drives and like going on like if we're driving from here to california that's like a 11 12 hour drive uh, maybe not 12 uh, depends on how fast you drive, really. If you drove a Tesla, you'd immediately get there in like eight hours, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but the problem is you'd have to like charge up halfway. Um, and then you'd probably need to wait. I mean, whatever I, the time it is to, to wait for the charge, you'd be sitting there waiting for your car to charge. And it just doesn't make sense. And especially when you're going to like Southern Utah um, or from here to Arizona or something, like there's not anywhere that you're going to be able to charge this. You're in the middle of nowhere. Like it's desert. There's nothing there. So it just doesn't make sense as much as I would like it to, as much as like the three like appeals to me. Um, and it's certainly prettier than the CRV that I currently own. Um, yeah. It yeah. They haven't sense. quite gotten there for certain types of driving and lifestyles as far yeah. as charging yet. But I feel like once the infrastructure is there, um, then then it could possibly be more uh, functional for a wider range. But there need, you need to have the you need to have the infrastructure. Just like just like there's gas stations every you know fifty miles or whatever. Like you know you need to have gas station and charging station so that you can actually um, so charge up your vehicle. My- my around town experience when I bought the car, I had it for a little over a year, the Chevy Volt, right? I was only getting 40, 40 miles on a charge. I, um, 
I never, I never changed the oil in over a year. So I mean, I didn't, I didn't hit 3000 miles on it, uh, on the internal combustion engine, driving the kids to and from school every day. Hmm. So like we're, we're close for, for city stuff, but you're right. I mean, if you're leaving, if you're leaving the city, it's, it's, it's difficult to be hundred percent electric. Yep. Um, are you kidding me? Yeah, we're getting the timer that, already? We've reached that time. It does seem like it's gone by fit past. We have now reached that time where Gary panics. Yeah. Well, we do actually have a listener question. Uh, occasionally we have listener questions. Most of the time our questions are, are fielded by Allison, but this time we do have a listener question. And as a reminder, you can always submit listener questions either by tweeting us at Binary Jazz on Twitter or by going to the website binaryjazz.us. Uh, but we do have a listener question from Danette, uh, who I believe might be a person that uh, Allison might have coerced into giving us a question. And she asks uh, us to describe in as much detail as possible your first Halloween costume. Oh, I will go SSR. first. <laughs> I will go first because I, I have a memory and I don't know if this is my first Halloween costume, um, but it is the first one that I remember. And uh, I was Dracula, and I had uh, so you know as as Dracula, and I have pictures, and I can I can probably post the pictures to the, the site because that'll be awesome. Um, as Dracula, I had a black wig that literally looked like Don King's hair, like it just went everywhere, uh, and. I had, you know, a black cape that was obviously made out of, of vinyl or some sort of artificial material. Um, I wore a white, like, button-up shirt, and I had this white face paint. Uh, the white face paint, uh, my dad did not want to get it on my eyes, so there's rings around my eyes. And the face paint was really, really bad quality, which meant that after about, after it dried, and then after about an hour or so, it started cracking. Um, <laughs> And it was, I remember it being incredibly uncomfortable and going out trick or treating with like face paint that's cracking on my face. And like, I feel like my face is literally cracking. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was my, the first Halloween costume that I can remember. I think the next year after that, I was a cowboy, which involved a hat and a shirt and a vest and cowboy boots and no makeup. No. I think I swore off makeup for a very long time after that. I know exactly uh, the quality of face makeup from that. Air. Like, oh, and it was horrible and just cakey. And, mm -hmm. and every Kmart had it available next to the plastic costumes, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Wait, I think I do the same. Yeah. Did you know, like, how did you know the character? Like, how did you choose? I don't know. I don't know how I knew the mythology of, of, of Dracula or vampires. I, just, I probably cartoons, I guess. Yeah. Like Scooby-Doo or something. I don't know. I... As is our custom, I'm not going to answer the direct question. I'm going to yeah. change it and answer it to my, <laughs> because it'll make it easier for me. So um, the question was uh, in detail, the first Halloween costume. I'm going to answer the first Halloween costume that I made myself. And I saw on the newspaper, like the month before Halloween, on the back page of, I don't even know what section, um, someone suggested making, a, um, making yourself a sandwich. And they had all of the pieces that you would need, <laughs> how you could make a sandwich. So I found a foam mattress, a nasty stained foam mattress we had in the garage. And I took out the, um, I, I don't know what you use it for, but the knives that you cut the turkey with on Thanksgiving or the, you know, the knives I'm talking about, it's like a handle and then the knives, like the electric knife, electric kitchen knife. And I cut that and then I- <laughs> You're trying to explain this to two people who don't eat meat. We're like, I don't know. <laughs> but you've, you've seen it though. You know the thing I'm talking about, right? I know, but yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess it was a dumb question. Like, you know the thing you cut your turkey with? No, I don't. Um, yeah, that thing, though. And it's always, like, 30 years old and, like, colored like it was made in the 70s. Like, that weird brown, greenish color, mm -hmm. yellow. Yeah, anyway, that thing. I cut, like, the shape of a sandwich. And then I spray-painted the edge. I made a piece of bread, and I spray-painted the edge brown. Um, and I took some green fabric and sewed it in so it was dripping over the edges like lettuce. And I dressed in a red sweatshirt so i was a tomato um I'm trying to remember what else I, oh no it was a blt specifically how did i make the bacon i don't recall the bacon but but then i wore this right for halloween and every house i went to was like 
Yeah, I need to find photos. Every house was like, oh, you're an adorable Ninja Turtle. And I was so mad all Halloween <laughs> night that everyone thought I was a Ninja Turtle when clearly I was a sandwich that I made myself. Um, and they were like pieces of bread were held together with like two pieces of um, elastic like over my shoulder. So I just threw it on like it was a signboard and I hadn't really planned. So it was kind of tight up top and stuck out the bottom. I mean, it was, it was crap. But I made it myself. How old were you? I don't know. Um, had to be... You're 25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. It was seven. No, it was um, seven years ago. It was, uh, I don't know that I was in middle school, but I might have been in middle school. Uh-huh. It was It was upper elementary and middle school. I also love yeah. that people thought you were a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> I was so pissed about that because the Ninja Turtles were not I cool that year. This costume kind of like the general vibe of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can you imagine that you open your door like, what the hell is that kid wearing? <laughs> like, it's green and brown, and I've seen this before. He's a Ninja Turtle, you know? <laughs> like, it wasn't identifiable. You, you, what, with, yeah, which Ninja Turtle did they think you were? I never got that far. I should have asked. Raphael, <laughs> <should've> obviously. Asked. <laughs> with the red, yeah. 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 I don't know. We also brought up food, so we, we've hit, we have hit all the topics. Yeah, there we go. Tesla, food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think you are an orb to Mars. It's, so. it's, it's your turn. Your first, uh, first Halloween costume you remember? My first Halloween costume I remember. I'm not used to answering the questions. Also, well, too, yeah, well, <laughs> it's, Thanks it's a lot, a, yeah, right. There you go. Um, I was. This isn't the. I played it pretty safe when I got to finally choose my own costumes, but I definitely remember being a bumblebee at a young age and there was like lots of gold glitter and I had a really awesome, like an awesome like headband situation with some sort of like gold ball at the end with, and again, the glitter got everywhere, I remember. But I remember also being pretty excited because I got to wear like my ballet shoes and tights and I was like this like really plump little bumblebee wandering around. Um, and I just liked the glitter of it. And it was just, uh, and I didn't get made fun of, which was great. That was a fear. Halloween is like <clears throat> anxiety ridden because choosing a costume was always like, you had to be something cool, but not too weird. Cause then people would make fun of you. So, and that's why later on in life, I was a witch for like seven years because I'm like, <laughs> you can't argue with being a witch. Like it's just a classic archetype. People can't mess with you. Um, but the bumblebee, I think, was the best. I kind of wish I still had that headband. Um, that'd be pretty great. <laughs> That's my first. I don't know what the first Halloween costume was that I made. Um, I, didn't. I made a lot of Halloween costumes for other people in university. I made people like a Calvin and Hobbes costume. Aww. We had a whole, and we had like different Calvins, so like Spaceman Spiff and like. <laughs> bunch of different versions and then one one Hobbs pretty much because we only knew one person who was tall enough to be Hobbs <laughs> so awesome yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah I have well, one more question but oh we have I, less than a minute do you think we have less than a minute and it's too good I think to short it's gonna, change it's gonna spill yeah. over I want to roll it over to another episode okay okay yeah. that's fair I'm down well, on that note, uh, before we go, uh, and maybe I'll get cut off during it while I'm saying this, but we have uh, decided to switch to weekly, So, uh, and this will already have been obvious by the time you're listening to this because we record this in advance. So uh, yeah, we're now a weekly show, and this is episode 1010, and uh, I, don't, I can't even do the math anymore. Yay! That's 10, right? Tell. Isn't 10? Is it 1010 is 10? I don't know. Two, four, we'll, eight, we'll work on eight. it. We'll workshop this. <laughs> we'll get to the bottom of it. Because well, one, zero, zero, one, two, four, eight, eight. It's eight. Yeah, ten. So it's yeah. ten. Okay. There you go. Yeah, if you count and you double, so one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty. You can do it in your fingers up to ten digits. I can only wow. do that after ten o'clock in the morning, though. So yeah. eight o'clock, I can't. I can't count on my fingers. Or you can install the binary watch. Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at binaryjazz. 
Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the forum on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz. Thank you.